Hi, I'm Dan from Gigaboots, and it's come time for me to fulfill that promise I made to you so long ago. I'm going to make the only decent comparison video of the PS5 and Xbox Series X specs on YouTube. Doing better than every other comparison that came before me isn't actually that hard, but this is going to be very complicated, and as such, we're going to take it one step at a time. In this episode of The Rant is Go, we're going to talk about the divide and teraflops, what that means in practical terms using examples, and other GPU-related performance divides that are interesting. Let's start with the supposedly massive difference in GPU performance between these two consoles by providing some historical context for this gap and clarifying some of the real-world ramifications it yields. Teraflops is a measurement of GPU power, specifically derived from how many floating point operations per second the ALUs in the GPU can perform. Though it's valid as a measurement of GPU performance, it doesn't work well when relating drastically different architectures, and it definitely shouldn't be considered a be-all, end-all measurement of performance when bereft of context. But the GPUs in the PS5 and Xbox Series X are architecturally similar, since they're both based on AMD's RDNA 2 microarchitecture. Even still, I'll do my best to talk about the teraflops divide contextually. The teraflops performance of these next-gen consoles breaks down like this. The PS5 has 10.28 teraflops, and the Xbox Series X has 12.155. Now then, you can either view this as the Xbox Series X is 18% more powerful than the PS5, or that the PS5 is 15.5% weaker than the Xbox Series X. In order to make more salient comparisons with visuals and such, I have to choose one of these to consistently reference, and one of them has a very tangible benefit. As such, I have chosen to frame it as the PS5 is 15.5% weaker than the Xbox Series X. Later in this episode, I'm going to show you exactly what that looks like. Anyway, the divide in teraflops performance between these two systems isn't even that wide, historically speaking. The PS4 Pro was capable of 30% fewer teraflops than the Xbox One X, and the gap between the PS4 and Xbox One was also about as wide, with the Xbox One having 28.8% less performance than the PS4. With that in mind, the teraflops performance gap of the next-gen systems is nearly half of what it was for the last two sets of systems from Microsoft and Sony. Combining that with the diminishing returns on performance and I'm certain visual differences between these two consoles won't be radical. In fact, I can visualize the difference right now. Let's assume a best-case scenario for the Xbox Series X. Let's assume that it can actualize the entirety of that performance advantage while running a game, which isn't trivial. It would require fully feeding all 52 compute units in the GPU every cycle. So, the Xbox Series X is in a perfect scenario where it can run a game at 4K60 by utilizing all of the CUs every frame. In this situation, how would the performance gap present itself? In what way would the PS5 be worse? Well, most modern games use dynamic resolutions to smooth out performance dips. This means that in our theoretical situation, the Xbox Series X would be running at a native 4K resolution and a buttery smooth 60 frames per second, while the PS5 would only be at 84.5% of that resolution, which works out to a disgusting 1987p which isn't a real resolution, but that's how dynamic resolutions work. Anyways, I'm about to show you the difference between these two resolutions, so make sure this video is playing back in full 4K resolution on a 4K TV. Are you ready? Okay, here you go. Here's console A. Hmm. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. Here's console B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's up. <clears> hmm. <throat> One more time. A and B. Feel free to go back and see if you can tell which console is which. But Dan, I can already hear the smarter amongst you saying, you showing the comparison like this doesn't account for YouTube's compression and the chroma subsampling of H.264 video. You're right, and that's why I put these two images over on Google Drive losslessly, allowing you to see the difference yourself. When I posted on Twitter months ago, 
my replies were full of people not being able to tell the difference at all. So, taking into account that any moving image is blurred by the human eye tracking it across the screen, and also that most games apply motion blur to objects in-game that are in motion, I don't think most people are going to be able to tell the difference without diligent A-B comparisons on high-quality displays or zooming in on screen caps. Previously, the target resolution on consoles was 1080p, and when you're running at that much lower of a resolution, losing a chunk of it is a lot more impactful. Nowadays, we're targeting 4K resolutions. The law of diminishing returns comes into play, and that's exacerbated by this gap in power being only a little over half of what it was between the PS4 and Xbox One. Does that mean the difference doesn't exist? No. That means that a 15.5% difference in resolution is negligible and a far cry from what many clueless people here on YouTube or on major gaming websites are portraying it as. More importantly though, that's the performance gap in a world where the Xbox Series X is fully able to actualize its execution hardware every cycle. The reality of the situation is far more complicated. You can go watch any digital foundry analysis of an Xbox One X or PS4 Pro game and see the performance gap there isn't as high as the difference in teraflops. There are innumerable things that get in the way of actualizing potential performance. With the PS5 and Xbox Series X, there's even more reason to believe this potential gap is smaller than you would assume. As Mark Cerny said, there are tangible advantages to Sony's approach of having a higher clock rate instead of more compute units. Aside from general cases of games not being able to fill all of the Series X's compute units with something to work on every cycle, there are more specific cases where having a higher clock rate works better than having more hardware. Also, it's easier to fully use 36 CUs in parallel than it is to fully use 48 CUs. When triangles are small, it's much harder to fill all those CUs with useful work. As both Sony and Microsoft said, one of the most amazing things coming out of these next-gen consoles is the capability of rendering much higher polygon models. Throughout the evolution of PCs and consoles, we've been relatively constrained geometrically due to this CPU overhead that comes from using higher polygon models. That's all changing. Using the geometry engine that Sony talks about, or the mesh shaders in the Xbox Series X, which are very likely the exact same thing, these two systems can now handle much higher polygon models without the huge CPU overhead that historically has prevented such things. Given the PS5's design, which has a much higher clock rate and faster SSD than the Xbox Series X, it's no wonder why Epic decided to debut Unreal Engine 5's Nanite technology, which renders unbelievably high polygon models, on the PlayStation 5. Tim Sweeney even said they worked super closely with Sony on the PlayStation 5's design. This makes sense, because Sony asked developers for insight when designing new consoles. At least, they do nowadays. Ultimately, I'm confident that the next-gen console's historically small teraflops gap will be negated to some extent by the wider instead of faster design of the Xbox Series X, and perhaps other factors too. If you're wondering why I haven't brought up the PS5's variable clock rate so far in this episode of the Rant Disco, that's because if you paid attention to the Road to PS5 video, Mark Cerny said, We expect the GPU to spend most of its time at or close to that frequency and performance. That doesn't mean all games will be running at 2.23 gigahertz and 3.5 gigahertz. When that worst case game arrives, it will run at a lower clock speed, but not too much lower. To reduce power by 10%, it only takes a couple of percent reduction in frequency. So I'd expect any down clocking to be pretty minor. Which I covered last episode on The Rant Is Go. You should probably watch more of these videos so you don't ask questions I've already answered. As former programmer for Crytek and Traveler's Tales, Matt Phillips said on his article over on Medium.com, No one statistic is a measure of power of a console. There are too many variables and no one calculation to produce a result. It varies per game, per engine, per firmware, per development team, and per patch, and it always will. Thanks for nothing, Thought Bubble. That graphic looked like garbage. Uh, 
that's all I'm going to cover in this episode of the Rant is Go. Uh, make sure to check out those images I linked in the description below. And uh, go read that article by Matt Phillips over on Medium.com. After you do that, go ahead and tell me what you guys think about all of this. And uh, be sure to look forward to the next episode of the Rant is Go when I compare these two uh, consoles. I'm going to talk about the RAM differences between them, the gap in SSD bandwidth, and Microsoft Secret Sauce that no one's really talking about for some reason. Tim, how old is your cup? This Gigaboots video was brought to you by the arcane powers of our executive producers. Esme, Nicholas Cameron, E. Lee Broyles, Star Falcon, Spaceman Spiff, Danny Richardson, Red Blaze 27, and 32X Wen. Thank you very much to our powerful executive producers. And also these guys. If you like this video and want to lend us your power, head on over to patreon.com slash gigaboots today.